What Descartes manages uh, to do in his discourse, De la Méthode, is to transform man, uh, this is still Guignot, transform man into an exceptional being, into a subject which is priority over all other beings. In short, man becomes the ground of all certainties and truths." End quote. No doubt, behind the Cartesian discovery of the mind and the centrality of the self, one can easily discover two connected strains of intellectual history. The first is the Renaissance cult of individuality. The second is the individualistic interpretation of Christianity, which begins with St. Augustine's confessions and comes to full flower with Luther. So there are two traditions behind this uh, sense of self. Let me just briefly explore them. Uh, what makes a person unique, this is Luther's August, Augustinian insight, is the hidden, private, innermost world of oneself. Understanding oneself as essentially mind in a Cartesian sense and only accidentally hooked up to a body. I can distinguish between my thoughts and emotions and the external masks every individual wears in the world. In the 17th century, to quote Lionel Trilling's Sincerity and Authenticity, an essay of 1974, the individual experiences the presence of an internal space. He begins to think of himself as playing various roles, as someone who stands outside or above his own personality. With this emergence of the subjective individualism, the true self, as they speak of it, is to be found by severing one's ties to community and to history. Since I am self-defining and autonomous, my family, my religion, my occupation, my body, my national origins are mere decorations that can cast off uh, mere detours in my self-invention. What matters is myself. And therefore, to quote again Guignon, who uh, uh, nicely encapsulates the issue, I must be faithful to my innermost impulses, needs, aspirational and aspirations and feelings. This Cartesian picture of the self, let me just add for the sake of clarity, shapes the view of the discursive construction of self as is understood in contemporary projects, such as, for instance, in France recently, 30 years ago, that of Roland Barthes. Barthes, in line with the insights forged by 17th and 18th century representations, views any idea of the subject as nothing other than a creation of language. The self he envisions is shattered, scattered, decentered, and always a fiction. This means that man as subject does not exist prior to language, nor is he separable from language. I mention this last radical understanding of self for two reasons. First, uh, because it demonstrably owes much to St. Augustine's theory of the self in the Confessions. Second, because it falls short of Vico's truly radical representations of self. Let me say, say something about Augustine, who actually Vico considered his own patron saint. And so there's a kind of Augustinian line from Augustine going all the way to Vico. So let me focus on Augustine. St. Augustine calls into question both the status of the I in his confessional narrative, the confessions, and the ability of language to bridge the distance between the temporal self and the eternal God. In the process of self-knowledge, which the confessions maps, the ultimate ascent of the self occurs in a dimension completely other than the world of time and history. It, takes pl it occurs in a place which Augustine anticipates but where he, Augustine, never resides in. One of the goals, though, of Vico's new science, let me shift to him, is to argue on behalf of the importance of historical reality. Let's keep this in mind. Human beings, to be understood, have to be contextualized in a culture and in their own specific history. It became necessary, therefore, that Vico began reflecting directly on subject, sub subjectivity, and he did so in the, in the autobiography, where he advances the view that what makes us human beings unique as individuals is not our internal space 
or a substantial self distinct from the roles we play in the world or our participation in the world. What makes us unique is the work we accomplish for ourselves and for others. And that work can be ourselves. Uh, we are the product of our own making. In this way, Vico retrieves from oblivion a more rigorous Augustinian understanding of the self as inextricably woven in the particular context of the historical community. So he needs to address the question of the self because the understanding of the self has become, as I've just shown, the distinctive mark of modernity. This is the point of all going around for Luther, Augustine, and Barth. The self, the idea of subjectivity, is the very image, the way we look at the world of what we call modernity. The genuine divide between the medieval past and the modern age. Uh, so how does he represent the self in history? One detail in the formal structure of Vico's autobiography goes a long way in suggesting his essential views. The autobiography is written in installments you know, over the years. So you cannot write the autobiography while you're still alive. You gotta keep doing it. And uh, so and the more you live, the more chapters we are going to add <laughs> to it. Taken together, it comes through as the story of Vico's intellectual developments from his childhood to 1723. And the second installment was added in 1728, the year after the publication of the New Science where he takes into task the various critics of his new science. Another installment will be added in 1731. A couple of reflections, therefore, force themselves on us. Why this idea of a provisional, right, a kind of, a sort of uh, a stage, a writing of autobiography in stages. First, Vico writes a history of his mind. It doesn't tell us much about anything else surrounding the concrete realities, but the mind. But the mind has a history. It's not fixed and it's not immutable. Against Descartes, who conceives of the mind as unalterable and fixed, Vico puts forth the notion of a mind which knows shifts, grows, changes, and is passionately involved with uh, the objects of his thoughts. Second, since the autobiography was written and revised over a period of eight years, the desultory, Temporally disconnected modality of the text's composition sheds light on Vico's major insight into the structure of the self. A second problem uh, of the autobiography is this. Anyone who wants to write an autobiography just needs a fixed vantage point. You can never write an autobiography without one. A perspective which allows the potential autobiographers to know what to se select from the rich inventory of one's experience. You can't write everything that you go through in life. It, it's, uh, you gotta make some selections. Because we live in a world, the contours of which are not clear, and no encounter we have in our daily interactions is anything then opaque to our consciousness, we must determine what is essential and what is subordinate in whatever we experience and carry within us in order to apply it to the world of our own representations. Uh, I have therefore to, uh, every, every autobiography is a process of selection of experience. Santa Gastin, who is the inventor of the, the autobiographical genre and whom Vico calls his special patron saint, can write his autobiographical confession from the point of view of his Christian conversion, which allows him to judge what is important or trivial as he finds the meaning of his life. You can think of Sartre's Le Mots, the narrative on intellectual vocation remains necessarily open-ended. You see, he, he, this is changing, he's projected onto the future. Short of this pattern, one jots down random notes or impressions, he writes a diary, for instance, or doomed to failure, or seeks the impossible recounting of everything that happens in one's life. I get, I get up in the morning, I brush my teeth, uh, what, it, 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 cannot, uh, it goes on forever. I need another life to be able to tell my life. Vico's autobiography, written over time, shows that the self, the meaning and authority of the self, is constituted by one's work. His polemical targets, the uh, 
the, that makes that may uh, makes him differ somewhat from the practices of the genre uh, uh, are staged from the very start of his text. And I avoid the Italian uh, section and go to the, give you the English. Uh, I wish I could read the Italian so you have a sense of of, of the extraordinary prose that he writes. Not, I don't find it, but this is the English, um, not mine, uh, Bergen's. Uh, Giambattista Vico was born in Naples. That's where it starts. In the year 1670, of upright parents who left a good name after them, his father was of a cheerful disposition, his mother of a quiet, melancholy temper. Both contributed to the character of the child. He was a boy of high spirits and impatient of rest. But at the age of seven, he fell headfirst from the top of a ladder to the floor below and remained a good five hours without motion or consciousness. The right side of the cranium the head here, was fractured, but the skin was not broken. The fracture gave rise to a large tumor and they were swelling. And the child suffered much loss of blood from the many deep <coughs> lancings. The surgeon, indeed, observing the broken cranium and considering the long period of unconsciousness, predicted that the boy would either die of it or grow up an idiot. However, <laughs> yes, by God's grace, another part of his prediction came true. But as a result of this mischance, he grew up with a melancholy and irritable temperament, such as belongs to the men of ingenuity and depth, who, thanks to the one, are quick as lightning in perception, and thanks to the other, take no pleasure in verbal cleverness or falsehoods. This is, well, this is the, the very beginning. The intent of the initial paragraph of the autobiography is to give the temporal and spatial coordinates of the self. The self's origins of birth in a world one has neither chosen nor can one determine. That's really the, the first thrust, the first lesson one can draw from that paragraph. In the opening sentence, which I gotta read the title, is Giambattista Vico, but he says, Mr. Il Signor Giambattista Vico, he was born in Naples, egli è nato in Napoli, l'anno 1670, da onesti parenti. He was, he was born in Naples. It's an autobiography, not written in the, in the I, in the, in the first person uh, form of the, the pronoun. The word signore, mister, Mr., mister, suggests that Vico is the master, that he enjoys a lordship over events. But the series of qualities and events befalling him, his temperament, the disposition of his parents, his fall from the ladder, shows that he has neither lordship nor power over his own world. The term signore, the mister, the lord, a kind of law, appears as a mere formula, bureaucratic formula. Even more interestingly, Vico writes about himself by using the third person singular uh, construction. He was born. He writes of himself as, he, as if he were another, somebody else. The writing self does not coincide with the acting self. The writing self is a, an author. He has acquired authority, and the authority of his voice depends on the fact that he is the author of the new science. It is the work that gives coherence, direction, and intelligibility to the apparent randomness of his intellectual quest. The rhetorical, this rhetorical strategy that I indicate just a few uh, uh, elements rests on the autobiography uh, on a different, sets the autobiography on a different path from St. Augustine's Confessions. The Confessions are written in the mode of retrospection. The author, who writes in the first person singular, looks back at his own past with detachment, as if he now were a different person from the one he once was. That's the only way you can write an autobiography, by alienating yourself from where you are. He writes, Augustine, St. Augustine writes with the belief that to make sense of one's life, one must know its end, its conclusion. The knowledge of the end, which is the death, which is death, defines the blurred contours of the events of daily uncertain living. Vico's strategy radically departs from the Augustinian model. 
unlike Augustine's retrospection or Dante's book of memory in the Vita Nuova, the new life, Vico tells his life as, a, as is projected on to the future, a future that he does not yet know. In this sense, his autobiography really recalls uh, letters to posterity, that, for instance, the Middle Ages, Petrarch writes, or the Vita Nuova of Dante, both of which rest on an open-ended trajectory. Like them, Vico understood that indeed life may be, un may be uh, caught, may be grasped backwards by an act of memory, but it must be lived forward in a redirection of time to the future. In short, the self is represented as a work in progress, caught in an open-ended historical adventure. The idea of the history of the self as the only possible representation of the self emerges from Vico's dismantling of all naturalistic models for understanding the subject. In other words, if you really want to understand the subject, the, yourself, you usually, you usually want to say, well, sociologically, I was born poor, uh, my mother was from Alaska or whatever, and then my father was from another place, and kind of naturalistic. And, and Vigo seems to be doing that. I was born from two honest parents, my mother who was cheerful, my father who was melancholy or the other way around, etc. Now, let's see how he navigates himself around this naturalistic model for the self. The materialistic belief that the future destiny of the self is contained with a deterministic, within a deterministic context of natural causes was dramatized by a physician in the Renaissance by the name of Girolamo Cardano, whose De Vita Propria Libra, the book about one's life, is the story of a physician, natural philosopher. Vico's reference to his own uh, Predominant humor, remember he speaks of himself being melancholy, is a discreet reference to Renaissance theories of melancholy that appear as the material mark of intellectual and philosoph uh, the intellectuals and philosophers. All the intellectual philosophers are melancholy because they are given to contemplation and destined to excel. This is a kind of uh, cliche about the importance of uh, the, the humor of melancholy for intellectual life. Yet this naturalistic pattern of melancholy uh, as a humor of the body, this is a naturalistic pattern is disrupted by a number of textual details. What story is Vico really telling? The story of a seven-year-old child who has fallen down from the staircase, lost consciousness for five hours, and is expected by the attending physician to die or grow, or grow not fully alert. But this stages Vico's polemic with naturalistic and generally uh, materialistic representations of the self. The physician, who is a natural philosopher, that's the way we understand physicians, physicians the physics, uh, the natural philosopher, misreads the signs of the sickness according to a mechanical law of cause and effect and the laws of evidence. In point of fact, the principle of causality is not given a priori as the natural philosopher believes. It is discovered afterwards, and once it is discovered, it comes through as a providential plan for Vico. The natural philosopher, in effect, short circuits history's openness by interpreting events according to a mechanical scheme of causality. More than that, his misreadings signal, misreading signals that natural science Sciences deal not with firm self-evidence of empirical facts, but with the divination of probabilities and hypotheses. Furthermore, the metaphor of falling, which no doubt is meant to recall the theology of man's fallen condition, allows us to assess the ground, as it were, on which Vico's notion of the subject rests. In contrast to the Cartesian view of the subject, as essentially disembodied mind or consciousness, yes res cogitans, and as the firm, certain foundation of all knowledge, Vigo drafts a picture of the subject in its full etymological force, a subjectum, as literally thrown under without a firm foundation, uh, losing control of oneself and provisionally without consciousness. If the naturalists are wrong in reducing life to a question of humors, the Cartesian philosophers are wrong in thinking that life is reducible to pure thought. The body matters. If, uh, if, if you get too hurt, you'll die. That's, that's the, what I'm trying to say here. From the viewpoint of the wounded child, ironically, the naturalists, for all the limits of their vision, are after all right in maintaining that one is hooked up to a body, that the body determines whether or not one is alive or dead. 
a critique of the major theoretical models about the constitution and representation of the self, the Augustinian, the Cartesian, the neoclassical fictions of the self, and the naturalist ones from the Renaissance naturalists, does not end here. Right at the outset, Vico gives his birthday is occurring in 1670, rather than, as documents show it did, in 1668. Why did he lie? Why is he lying? I mean, it looks like a, a teenager, a girl who is once, wants to be 14 rather than 13, something like that. It is an error. Is it an error he makes or is it a misrepresentation? It is a misrepresentation and an error. And it serves several.